Purgatory, Chapter 1 Purgatory and the Divine Plan Purgatory occupies an important place in our holy religion. It forms one of the principal parts of the works of Jesus Christ and plays an essential role in the economy of the salvation of man. Let us call to mind that the Holy Church of God, considered as a whole, is composed of three parts, the Church Militant, the Church Triumphant, and the Church Suffering or Purgatory. This triple church constitutes the mystical body of Jesus Christ, and the souls in Purgatory are no less his members than all their faithful upon earth and the elect in heaven. In the gospel, the church is ordinarily called the kingdom of heaven. Now purgatory, just as the heavenly and terrestrial church, is a province of this vast kingdom. The three sister churches have incessant relations with one another, a continual communication which we call the communion of saints. These relations have no other object than to conduct souls to their eternal glory, the final term to which all the elect tend. The three churches mutually assist in peopling heaven, which is the permanent city, the glorious Jerusalem. What then is the work which we, members of the church militant, have to do with the souls in purgatory? We have to alleviate their sufferings. God has placed in our hands the key of this mysterious prison. It is prayer for the dead, devotion to the souls in purgatory. Purgatory Chapter 2 Prayer for the Dead, Fear and Confidence Prayer for the Departed, Sacrifices, and suffrages for the dead form a part of Christian worship, and devotion towards the souls in purgatory is a devotion which the Holy Ghost infuses with charity into the hearts of the faithful. It is a holy and wholesome thought, says Holy Scripture, to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from sins. Second Maccabees 12.46 In order to be perfect, devotion to the souls in purgatory must be animated both by a spirit of fear and a spirit of confidence. On the one hand, the sanctity of God and his justice inspires us with a solitary fear. On the other, his infinite mercy gives us a boundless confidence. God is sanctity itself, much more so than the sun is light and no shadow of sin can endure before his face. Thine eyes are pure, says the prophet, and thou canst not look on iniquity. When iniquity manifests itself in creatures, the sanctity of God exacts expiation, and when this expiation is made in all rigor of justice, it is terrible. It is for this reason that the scripture says again, Holy and terrible is his name. As though it would say, his justice is terrible because his sanctity is infinite. The justice of God is terrible, and it punishes with extreme rigor even the most trivial faults. The reason is that these faults, light in our own eyes, are in no wise so before God. The least sin displeases him infinitely, And on account of this infinite sanctity which is offended, the slightest transgression assumes enormous proportions and demands enormous atonement. This explains the terrible severity of the pains of the other life and should penetrate us with a holy fear. This fear of purgatory is a solitary fear. Its effect is not only to animate us with a charitable compassion towards the poor suffering souls, but also with a vigilant zeal for our own spiritual welfare. Think of the fire of purgatory, and you will endeavor to avoid these least faults. Think of the fire of purgatory, and you will practice penance, that you may satisfy divine justice in this world rather than the next. Let us, however, guard against excessive fear and not to lose confidence. 
Let us not forget the mercy of God, which is not less infinite than his justice. Thy mercy, Lord, is great above the heavens, says the prophet. And elsewhere, the Lord is gracious and merciful, patient and plenteous in mercy. This ineffable mercy should calm the most lively apprehensions and fill us with a holy confidence, according to the words, In thee, O Lord, I have hoped. Let me never be put to confusion. Psalm 70 If we are animated with this double sentiment, if our confidence in God's mercy is equal to the fear with which his justice inspires us, we shall have the true spirit of devotion to the souls in purgatory. This double sentiment springs naturally from the dogma of purgatory rightly understood, a dogma which contains the double mystery of justice and mercy, of justice which punishes, of mercy which pardons. It is from this double point of view that we are about to consider purgatory and illustrate its, its doctrine. Purgatory, Chapter 3 The Word Purgatory, Catholic Doctrine, Council of Trent, Converted Questions The word purgatory is sometimes taken to mean a place, sometimes in an intermediate state between hell and heaven. It is, properly speaking, the condition of souls which, at the moment of death, are in the state of grace, but which have not completely expiated their faults, nor attained the degree of purity necessary to enjoy the vision of God. Purgatory is, then, a transitory state, which terminates in a life of everlasting happiness. It is not a trial by which merit may be gained or lost, but a state of atonement and expiation. The soul has arrived at the term of its earthly career. That life was a time of trial, a time of merit for the soul, a time of mercy on the part of God. This time once expired, nothing but justice is to be expected from God. Whilst the soul can neither gain nor lose merit, she remains in the state in which death found her, and since it found her in the state of sanctifying grace, she is certain of never forfeiting that happy state and arriving at the eternal possession of God. Nevertheless, since she is burdened with the certain doubts of temporal punishment, she must satisfy divine justice by enduring this punishment in all its rigor. Such is the signification of the word purgatory and the condition of the souls which are there. On this subject, the Church proposes two truths clearly defined as dogmas of faith. First, that there is a purgatory. Second, that the souls which are in purgatory may be assisted by the suffrages of the faithful especially by the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Besides these two dogmatic points, there are several doctrinal questions which the Church has not decided, and which are more or less clearly solved by the doctors. These questions relate, first, to the location of purgatory, second, to the nature of its sufferings, third, to the number and condition of the souls which are in purgatory, Fourth, to the certainty that they have of their beatitude. Fifth, to the duration of their sufferings. Sixth, to the intervention of the living in their behalf and the application of the suffrages of the Church. Purgatory, Chapter 4 Location of Purgatory Doctrine of Theologians Catechism of the Council of Trent and St. Thomas Aquinas. Although faith tells us nothing definite regarding the location of purgatory, the most common opinion, which most accords with the language of Scripture, and which is the most generally received among theologians, places it in the bowels of the earth, not far from hell of the reprobates. Theologians are almost unanimous, says Bellarmine, in teaching that purgatory, 
at least the ordinary place of expiation, is situated in the interior of the earth, that the souls in purgatory and the reprobate are in the same subterranean space, in the deep abyss which the scripture calls hell. When we say in the Apostles' Creed that after his death Jesus Christ descended into hell, the name hell, says the Catechism of the Council of Trent, signifies those hidden places where the souls are detained, which have not yet reached eternal beatitude. But these prisons are of different kinds. One is dark and gloomy dungeon, where the damned are continually tormented by evil spirits and by a fire which is never extinguished. This place, which is hell properly so called, is also named Gehenna and Abyss. There is another hell which contains the fire of purgatory. There the souls of the just suffer a certain time, that they may become entirely purified before being admitted to their heavenly fatherland, which nothing defiled can ever enter. A third hell was that into which the souls of the saints who died before the coming of Jesus Christ were received, and in which they enjoyed peaceful repose exempt from pain, consoled and sustained by the hope of their redemption. They were those souls who awaited Jesus Christ in Abraham's bosom, and which were delivered when Christ descended into hell. Our Savior suddenly diffused among them a brilliant light, which filled them with infinite joy and gave them a sovereign beatitude, which is the vision of God. Then was fulfilled the promise of Jesus to the good thief, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. A very probable opinion, says St. Thomas, and one which moreover corresponds with the words of the saints in particular revelation, is that purgatory has a double place for expiation. The first will be destined for the generality of souls, and is situated below, near to hell, the second will be for particular cases, and it is from thence that so many apparitions occur. The Holy Doctor admits, then like so many others who share his opinions, that sometimes divine justice assigns a special place of purification to certain souls, and even permits them to appear either to instruct the living or to procure for the departed the suffrages for which they stand in need sometimes also for other motives worthy of the wisdom and mercy of God. Since we are not writing a controversial treatise, we add neither proofs nor refutations. These can be seen in authors such as Suarez and Bellarmine. We will content ourselves by remarking that the opinion concerning a subterranean hell has nothing to fear from modern science. A science purely natural is incompetent in questions which belong, as this one does, to the supernatural order. Moreover, we know that spirits may be in a place occupied by bodies, as though these bodies did not exist. Whatever then the interior of the earth may be, whether it may be entirely of fire, as geologists commonly say, or whether it be in any other state, there is nothing to prevent its serving as a subjourn of spirits, even of spirits clothed with a risen body. The Apostle St. Paul teaches us that the air is filled with the multitude of evil spirits. We have to combat, says he, against the spirits of wickedness in the high places. Ephesians 6.12 On the other hand, we know that the good angels who protect us are no less numerous in the world. Now if angels and other spirits can inhabit our atmosphere, whilst the physical body is not in the least degree changed, why cannot the souls of the dead dwell in the bosom of the earth? 